So first, I gave you the definition of a Sinai billion map. And there is a minimum time between collisions. And the curvature is bounded from below and from above. And then I told you about how to construct the SRV measure with a transfer operator. And uh, what we did is that we found a, a Banach space of distributions on which we had a spectral gap. And I forgot to say here there's a hyperbolicity exponent which is at least this. And the spectral gap was related to the fact that in the Banach space there is some Holder uh, regularity uh, in the unstable direction and some kind of dual in the stable direction. And so what appears, so I got some complaints about my handwriting, but what appears was this, where beta and zeta were two positive Holder regularity exponents. So this, this is what's important to get the spectral gap. Although I did not explain how this appears in the, in the Lazar-Tayork inequality. And to construct this space, we used uh, some stable curves, and I explained that although I define the space by using the exact stable uh, manifold, a subset of the exact stable manifold, the proof of uh, Demers and Jung, which was, was discussed, use more general stable curves which are in stable cones and thus makes this Banach space suitable for, for uh, perturbations, to study perturbations of the billiard. Okay, and then finally we move to the main topic of this course, which is to construct a measure of maximum entropy for the uh, billiard map. And for this we're going to introduce a new uh, a Banach space of, uh, of uh, distributions. And I also added an assumption. So the first assumption I added was that we have Finite horizon in a sense slightly stronger than requiring tau max to be finite. Actually, I don't allow um, orbits which have only grazing tangencies. Remember, the enemy is this. Uh, there are these two parameters, r phi, and the enemies are these grazing uh, grazing uh, orbits, tangent uh, tangential orbits. And then this is a singularity set, and then we have this iterated singularity set, okay? So I have a finite horizon condition which is slightly stronger than that, which I just stated early. And by the way, somebody asked me after the talk, and I was very tired, so I, I answered some, some nonsense. I mean, if the, if the horizon, if tau max is infinite, you can look at Chernoff's old paper, and you will see that actually the topological entropy is infinite, okay? So if the horizon is infinite, the topological entropy is infinite. So which topological entropy? I mean, if you look at the, if you look at what the paper, I think you understand that this is the, the, the piezin pitt scale entropy, okay? Sorry? Of T, but to restrict it basically, basically to this. I mean, not exactly this M prime that we were discussing yesterday, which was what you get when you remove the singular, singular set, but basically the same. You can ask, but I won't answer. <laughs> there are some results, but I, I won't discuss this today. Yes. So uh, yes, and um, okay. So what did I? What result did I say yesterday? So that's the first uh, result of our papers. So just to remind you, we, we, we define 
an entropy by taking the limit of the cardinality of Mn. So what is Mn? It's a partition of the, the manifold, right? This is this two-dimensional manifold. Into, uh, from which you removed the, so if you fix, if n is finite, this is a finite union of, of curves, and you partition this set minus the curves into maximal connected components. And I think I didn't mention it, but Sn when n is positive, these are not stable manifolds, but they are stable curves. They are in the stable cones. So there are curves which are, this partition looks a little bit like, well, sorry, I'm not good at drawing, right? This partition looks a little bit like this for any finite n. So I, I said this, and I said this is a, a bound for the Kolmogorov entropy. Okay, this is the first theorem. And I also mentioned that this is also what you get if you take the separate definition with separated sets or with spanning sets. And I also mentioned that this H star is bigger than, for the moment we only know that it's not smaller than the, the piezin pitt scale, bowen piezin pitt scale topological entropy. And in particular, I put a limb here and not a limb soup. So part of this theorem is to prove the sub um, multiplicativity of the cardinality of Mn, okay? Which is not very hard to prove. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's what I'm going to say. And now we want to show existence of a measure of maximum entropy. Now that we have a good definition of the topological entropy, or maybe I should say a workable definition because there's nothing wrong with a piezin pitt scale entropy. It's just that we cannot use it uh, to construct a measure. And to show the existence of the measure of maximum entropy, to construct a measure of maximum entropy, we need, I'm not saying that you need, but we need, I suspect you also need, but I cannot prove it. We need an additional condition. So to state this condition, I need a notation. So you fix some angle, which is not equal to pi over two, but very close to pi, over, as close to pi over two as you want. And you fix some integer which is as large as you want. And given these two, given these two choices, you let S zero be such that, so the smallest number such that every orbit of length exactly n0 has at most a proportion s0 of collisions which are almost tangential in the sense that the angle is at least equal to phi0. So why do I know that this number is not equal to one? This is because um, the horizon is finite, okay? And if I assume, if you assume that there are, are no triple tangencies, to three successive tangential, tangen uh, tangential collision, then you can prove it's an exercise 
that S0 is smaller than two thirds, okay? And if there are no periodic orbits uh, which have at least one grazing co collision, I think you can prove something much better. I think you can even prove that S0 can be taken as small as you want by choosing phi zero and N zero uh, close to pi over two and, and big enough, respectively. And there's a conjecture of Pierre-Antoine, can I stay? So uh, Pierre-Antoine has a conjecture of Pierre-Antoine be enough, uh, which says the following, you can correct me if it's wrong, for any epsilon positive, Tables, so it's not stated very precisely, but it's a conjecture, right? The, the billiard tables, so you have to put a topology on the set of possible billiard tables, such that S0 is small. This set of billiard table is large, so open and dense. Okay, and I think that Giovanni Forni also believes that uh, the complement of the set has measure zero. But since he's not here, I'm not going to write it on the board. Okay, so basically we think this number is in general very small. Okay, it's S zero. And what is the additional assumption? So the condition that I will suppose from now on, I put in call it star. The condition is that the supremum of H mu so the Kolmogorov entropy over ergodic T invariant probability is bigger than S0 log two. So I try to convince you uh, that this condition is not crazy because S0 in general is rather small. And let me just mention that this condition is checkable because we have a bound since we know that the, the, the output of exponent is bounded by this one plus two kappa min tau min, we have a bound for the entropy, the Kolmogorov entropy of the SRB measure, and this is so not smaller than one plus two kappa min tau min. So if this is bigger than one, then this is bigger than two, and so the condition is always uh, Satisfied, right? Well, as soon as this is bigger than one, strictly, then the, no, even not strictly. As soon as this is bigger than one, then the condition is satisfied. So the condition is checkable. Okay, so from now on, we make this uh, assumption. And, um, and now I'm going to state the theorem. So I'm going to say the main theorem of our paper, which is about this um, <coughs> constructing this measure of uh, maximal entropy. So theorem one. So we have a two-dimensional Sinai billiard with finite horizon. And let me repeat it. We assume this condition which I just stated. Then there exists a T invariant Ergo, well, probably, well, I see this later. Probability measure which realizes, so this, whose, uh, topo, so whose Kolmogorov entropy realizes a supremum of the entropy over all T invariant ergodic probability measures. 
Okay, so we found a measure which realizes a maximum. And in addition, we can prove several things. So first, um, this entropy is actually equal to the kazin pitsko topological entropy, which proves, the, uh, unfortunately, it's not on the board, uh, it's not visible anymore, but um, We had one inequality, right, for the phasing physical entropy, and this gives uh, the second one, because now we know that H star is equal to the soup, and that's also equal to that. Okay, now second uh, fact, and that's, I think that's pretty exciting. Yes? Because of theorem zero, so it cannot be bigger, Right? So, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So that's why I showed the previous theorem. Yeah. So, uh, so the other information is that mu star is T adapted. So I found this definition in a paper of Lima and um, of Yuri Lima and Carlos Mateus. But this is a definition which is maybe implicit in the Catox, Trelsin, Le Drapier. I mean, it's a, so what does it mean to adapted? So I have these bad guys, the singularity, singularity curves. So S plus and S minus one are the curves on which uh, either T or T minus one has a singularity. I look at the distance of a point to the singularity curve, take the log, and then I take the average with respect to mu star, and this is finite. And actually we show something much more precise than that, okay? So that's a kind of nice property. Um, and this allows us to show lots of stuff, like there are no atoms, uh, the stable and, curve, stable and unstable curves have zero mass with respect to mu star. Almost every x with respect to mu star has unstable and stable manifolds of strictly positive length. So this is really important. And also the reason I state it as a second claim of the theorem is because it's used to show uh, most of the things which come later. So the next thing we know is that this measure has full support, so it gives positive mass to any open set, non-empty open set. And since I probably won't have the time to say much about the proof, let me tell you that here, to, to get this property, we need to show the absolute continuity of the stable uh, foliation with respect to mu star, right? So of course it's well known that the SRB measure is absolutely continuous, which is very important property, which is used to show mixing and lots of other stuff for the SRB measure. But the fact that uh, this new measure that we constructed is absolutely continuous was not known, and we had to prove it, and it's used already here. And maybe since I'm giving you some little teasers, which probably would be all you get to know about the proof, I can tell you that to show Well, actually, just to construct mu star, we're going to use more of this counting bound. So I, I told you the, the, the counting bound that you get from the um, sub-multiplicativity property. Uh, I, I think I mentioned it yesterday. That's the easy one. So let me just remind you that from the sub-multiplicativity, we have this. 
No constant, no, no nothing. But to get this, we need to have the lower bound with a constant now. So to get this, to construct this measure, we need this lower bound, which is a bit harder to prove, and uses Cantor rectangles. So these are rectangles where you have all, uh, with a property that any point in the rectangle has stable and unstable fold with cross uh, fully. I won't have the time to tell you more about this, but they are in the book of Chernoff and Makarian. It's a classical tool in billiard. So to get this lower bound. And then we have another counting, another counting bound which is important to construct the measure. And this is a lower bound on the set GNW. Do you remember GNW? So you take a, a, you take a stable manifold and you iterate it n times in the past. So it becomes bigger, you have to cut it, you have to cut it because of the singularities, you have to cut it uh, whenever it becomes bigger, its size becomes, there was a maximum size in the definition of WS, whenever its size becomes delta zero. And in discussion yesterday, we also had to cut it when it's, it, go, it, it goes across several homogeneity layers. So yesterday we had GN hat, because we were cutting across whenever you went across several homogeneity layers. Now I'm going to define very soon GN where you don't, well I already defined it, where you don't cut when you go across homogeneity layers. And there is a, there is a lower bound, which actually is quite hard to prove, and that's why I got confused when one said that lower bounds are easy. I mean, they are easy, as, uh, sorry, what am I saying? Uh, what am I saying? No, I'm very confused. No, that's true. Here, the lower bounds are. No, I got confused, right? This, uh, uh, I got confused. So, this sub multiplicativity. Oh, I find this very confusing. So, uh, let me say what I told you yesterday. Sorry. I find these things extremely confusing. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, I said it wrong. Sorry. So, uh, but first of all, of course, there is no minus here. Sorry, that was a typo. But there's the real mistake, which is not a typo, it's just that I got confused. The sum multiplicativity implies the lower bound, so that's easy. That's from sum multiplicativity. And the hard part is this one. Sorry. So this uses a counter rectangle, that's hard. Okay, and this fits with the philosophy that Bohn was discussing. So for uh, counting bounds, the lower bounds are easy and the upper bounds are hard, okay? But the reason I got confused is this bound is also hard. Okay, okay, sorry about that. I hope it's clear now. So let me go back to my proof. So we also prove that mu star is Bernoulli. And as I mentioned uh, yesterday morning, this implies... Is that for Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, there exists some... For, uh, I think it's for any delta one. If you look at W, which has size, bounded from below, then you have this. So mu star is Bernoulli, and as I told you yesterday, this implies mixing and uh, ergodic, and actually it implies Kolmogorov mixing, which implies mixing, which implies ergodic. And I think I mentioned yesterday that we actually prove K-mixing first, and this uses again the absolute continuity because we use a the usual combination of the 
uh, Hopf argument, and then the uh, Pinsker partition, uh, like in the work of Piesin, but uh, now we're doing, when we talk about mod zero, right? I mean, when you work, work, work with partitions, Pinsker partitions, there's always mod zero in the background and you have to be very careful what it means and here it's with respect to mu star, so we really need this absolute continuity to, to do this argument. And the last thing that we proved is that if mu star is equal to mu SRB, so we cannot prove that this never happens. I think it never happens, right? But we cannot prove that it never happens. The only thing we can prove for the moment is that if they coincide, then any non-grazing periodic orbit, so non-grazing periodic orbit is a periodic orbit which has no, uh, no collision which is tangential, right? So any non-grazing periodic orbit of period, say, N has this very rigid uh, and crazy a property, which I think is never going to happen, that its uh, multiplier is exactly the topological entropy. Sorry, N. Right? Is such that you have this. So of course, I mean, I think any, everybody believes that this is not possible uh, for a Sinai billiard, but um, I don't know how to prove that it's not possible. And since we're talking about periodic orbits, let me just mention that there is a paper of a, so remark, since we have property uh, B, and since any, and since the, this invariant measure has positive Kolmogorov entropy, it's also hyperbolic, it has positive Lyapunov exponent, we are in the framework uh, plus positive Lyapunov exponent from the start. This is by the real inequality. Then we can apply some results of a paper of uh, Lima and Mateus, which I already mentioned, the one where they introduce the definition of um, adapted measure. And uh, in particular, this gives us a lower bound on the cardinality of periodic or, or fixed points of uh, the iterates of the map. And so what you expect is this. So J, H star. But for technical reasons, uh, you need to put some period here. Okay, and uh, I gave this talk in Edinburgh last year and then I had a conversation with Omri and uh, he's probably here somewhere, you can see him. And uh, okay, and then he said, well, why can't you get the upper bound? I mean, the cones are uniformly transversal and, uh, but I mean, I can't get the upper bound. I would be very happy if someone could get the upper bound and tell me how to get the upper bound. For the moment, we only have the, the lower bound. Okay, sorry? What do you mean non-trivial period? I don't know how to show that N0 is equal to one. I expect it's not because the billiard is mixing, right? That's what you're saying, right? But I was not able to, to use the information that the billiard is mixing to exclude this. Maybe I'm just being stupid. Maybe uh, Jerome and Sylvain know how to do it. I don't know, maybe it's an act, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe by using some work by Jerome and Sylvain, you can show that uh, since the billiard is mixing, and zero is equal to one, but I don't know how to do it, okay? Okay, so, um, so maybe before I give you some bad news, which we'll probably guess from the statements which are on the board, let me, uh, let me tell you how you prove uh, B, because uh, I told you we have a more precise bound, so let me tell you what the bound is. 
to get the admissibility property, right? So the key information is that if we have this property star, then there exists some gamma bigger than one, such that for any n, there exists a constant, such that for any epsilon, if I look at these curves, uh, these singularity curves of, uh, uh, of uh, generation n, and I look at an epsilon neighborhood, neighborhood for the usual metric on the on the on our manifold, and I take the measure with respect to mu star, then it doesn't grow faster than one over log epsilon to the gamma. And the point is that gamma is bigger than one, so then you get the integrability that you need to get admissibility, okay? And uh, I always get confused uh, with borel cantelli but uh, uh, you can use borel cantelli to exploit this information and show lower bounds on the, on the distance of the iterates of mu star almost every initial point to the singularity set Sn. Okay, so let me just write it without quantifiers. So this plus Boyle Cantelli gives you bounds of the type mu almost every x. You have uh, d tk x Sn bigger than some constant e to the minus a times k to the small a. So there exists, well, I have to write the quantifiers, right? For any a bigger than one over gamma, for any big A, there exists C for any n, for any j, right? And the point is that a can be taken smaller than one, right? That's a point. So this is what you get from this key lemma. And we use this, such, uh, we use this actually, um, I think, only to get the last claim. We don't really use this, this uh, lower bound, except to prove the last claim. But it's kind of cute to know this, right? Okay, so these are the good news, and now the bad news. So as you can see from the statement, um, uh, we have uh, mixing, but uh, maybe I can put it in red or something. So we have uh, don't claim anything about the speed. In particular, we don't have a spectral gap. I think I already mentioned this yesterday. Uh, we have a transfer, I will introduce a transfer operator. So when did I start, by the way? I didn't pay it. Seven minutes late. Seven yeah, minutes seven late. Minutes. So I talk until... Uh... Seven. Okay, very good. <laughs> so, um, my God. So the reason we don't claim any speed is because we lose a spectral gap. No spectral gap. And um, once I gave a talk and uh, when I showed this bound, Stefano Luzato says that probably you can construct a Young Tower and use it to get polynomial rates because you have this information. But as far as I know, he hasn't done it. But I, I think it's, that's true, you can get polynomial rates uh, if you work hard. And the most embarrassing thing actually is, sorry? Uh, I think there is no exponential mixing, but I don't know how to prove it. It's just a hunch. You know? So, um, okay, the, the main um, thing that we don't prove is that we don't claim uniqueness. So again, since we have this uh, adapted property, we can apply this result of uh, this paper of Lima and Mateus, 
and they tell us that there are only countably many uh, adapted, T adapted measures of ma maximum entropy. And I don't remember if it was Sylvain or Jerome, but one of them explained to me that by using, I think, more cleverly some work of Sarig, and maybe it's done in your paper. Actually, there's only one, since the, since the Bailey is transitive, you know the Bailey is transitive, actually there's only one T adapted uh, measure maximum entropy, or maybe it was Sylvain. <laughs> Uh, just a policy for transitivity, when we were here, we had this question or two, so I went to uh, Ah, so you're not sure, okay. But in any case, there are at most countably many, okay? There are at most countably many T adapted measure of maximum entropy. But we don't even know that, we don't know if all measures of maximum entropy are T adapted, okay? That's the main point. We don't know if a measure of maximum entropy is T adapted. In principle, there could be a measure of maximum entropy, which is just living close to these singularity lines. I don't think so, but especially if you put this assumption here, right? If you don't put this assumption, really, I don't have anything to say, but with this assumption here, but we don't know how to prove it, okay? But so, yes? Yes, that's a bound, so that's a bound that we have, right? So yeah, we have finite entropy. And that this uses um, finite horizon, yes? So finite it's horizon. It's yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you have infinitely much point, then you need to have zero dimension, right? If you have infinitely many what? If you have infinite level of exponent, but which condition? You don't have infinite level of exponents. No, yeah. but if it was not T adapted. Yes. It would have the infinite exponent, maybe? Um, maybe, I don't know, yeah, maybe, I don't know. I don't, even, yeah, I don't know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but maybe can you keep this for later? Because I think you're trying to write the next paper and I only have 15 minutes left. <laughs> yeah, you can put, ask your question at the end, after you finish the proof, just finish the proof in your head. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, these questions are very interesting, but I would like to say a little bit more. <laughs> Because after all, I promised to tell you what the transfer operator was, and I didn't even write it on the board yet. So okay, now let me tell you, I, I gave you the statement, now let me tell you a little bit about the transfer operator and about the Banach space. So what is a transfer operator that we're going to use? So we're going to change the, the weight. So we still compose with the dynamics, as usual. But now we have to put a different weight because we are talking about a different equilibrium state, a different Gibbs state. And the weight that we have is not the constant function, but it's one over the stable Jacobian, which is defined almost everywhere, right? So uh, you can start by defining this, uh, sorry, what is this? You can uh, define this uh, on measurable functions, for example. And let me just mention two facts. Uh, so one fact is that what we have in the denominator here behaves like cos phi. So close to the singularities, it blows up. It goes to zero, so one over this blows up, right? So this is not a nice weight. It's a very unpleasant weight. And if you are surprised uh, because you're used to the expanding situation or to this, uh, or to this uh, Lai Sang Yong towers or when you have a non-invertible map and then the weight for the measure maximum entropy is just one. Well, maybe I could uh, quote what uh, was mentioned in the talk of Malou Jezekel uh, this week. So if you look at the transfer operator LG, which is G, times F composed with T minus one, uh, and G is positive. And if you look at the easy case where F is Anosov, right? Then uh, the, 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 the eigenvectors of this guy will give rise to the equilibrium state, uh, not for, uh, Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, sorry, yes. Maybe I should call it something else, right, because T is a billion, yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, so if you look at this operator, it gives you the equilibrium states for, 
for the logarithm, not of g, but g times the determinant of the twiddle. So in Malo's talk, he had the unstable here, but he was reversing time, right? And uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is well known. I mean, for example, it's, uh, it's in the paper of, uh, of uh, Guezel Liverani. Their second paper. And I do it also in, uh, in my book, my, my second book. So, okay. So that's the way it works when you have hyperbolic dynamics. So that's a transfer operator. And it's very nasty because you have this uh, stable Jacobian in the denominator. And so how do you use a, a transfer operator? Here I wave my hands, I say you construct the equilibrium state by using, how do you do that? It's a, this parry measure approach. So I'm going to try to define the Banach space, but let me just tell you the, the, the key idea. So what is this? How do you construct? So this is used in this paper of Guezel Nibahani, for example. How do you construct the equilibrium state? Uh, and let's go back to the billiard now. Uh, you you find, uh, so you have this space of distributions that I'm going to introduce. So they contain all C1 functions, but okay. And you have the, the transfer operator acting on this space. And you show uh, that there is a fixed, uh, not fixed, but a maximum eigenvector. So you show that there is a, an element of this space. And actually I have to tell you that there's also a weak space. Sorry, sorry. So as yesterday, there's also a, a weak Banach space. And you show that in this setting, the maximal eigenvector, so the operator is going to be bounded both on the weak and on a strong space. But the maximal eigenvector, we only find it in the weak space. Okay? So we show that the spectral radius is equal to exponential of h star. h star was defined in theorem zero. We show that the, the spectral radius on both spaces is equal to e to the h star, and we find a maximal eigenvector. And we don't prove that it's uh, simple. And Francois has complained many times about this. I think if you, re if you work in this space, since uh, this, the um, object in this space, they satisfy morally these kind of conditions, and in particular they are t adapted, we could probably show uniqueness in this space. But that wouldn't do much for us. It would basically show that there's uniqueness in the space, which is even weaker than to say that there's uniqueness within T adapted, so we didn't do it. So we show this, and we also show that the dual operator, so I like to use a star for duals, right? Some people don't like this. So we show that the dual operator has a maximal uh, eigenvector, which is in the dual of the weak space, okay? And now the nice thing is that uh, since uh, everything is positive by constructions, uh, these distributions are non-negative. Okay, so in principle there are distributions of order at most one, but since they are non-negative, there are actually measures, both of them, actually. So new, new, Mu and mu tilde are in the dual of C0. They are measures. Measures. This is a very classical result, right? Uh, Schwarz. So I didn't say this is because positivity. Positivity. 
or non-negativity, okay? So there are measures. And then how do you define mu star? Right, the goal is to construct mu star from the left and right eigenvalue. You make the product, so what does it mean to make the product? Uh, so we define mu star. So if you take a test function, which is uh, C1, or let's say C infinity, just to have, uh, uh, yeah. How do I define mu star of psi? And then, of course, you have to go to continuous function to show that it's a measure, and it's basically the same kind of argument. So what you do, you multiply nu by psi. So nu is a, nu is a measure, so it's safe to multiply by a, a smooth function. This gives you a, an element, um, sorry, sorry, I'm going too fast, so I'm panicking. So nu is in uh, BW. When you multiply by smooth function, you stay in BW. That's the property of BW. And nu tilde is in the dual of BW. So this is a well-defined number, and so this defines a distribution. And then again, by positivity, you show that this distribution is um, a measure, okay? And there's one tricky part, actually. The only tricky part is to show that um, it's non-trivial. <laughs> it could be zero, right? And so uh, you have to show that, um, you have to show, need to show that a new tilde of new is non-zero. And this uses some of these hard lower bounds. This one, actually which uses a counter rectangle. So that's the, the tricky part. So now I have uh, uh, five minutes. So uh, what am I going to do? So maybe I can tell you that we don't have a real uh, uh, Lazotayork um, inequality because we don't, uh, we don't have this holder Space. So I don't know how much I can say, but uh... so the most important thing is that uh, remember the computation from yesterday. So yesterday we had the SRB transfer operator. And so the weight was one over the Jacobian. And in the Banach space, we had to integrate over this you know, stable curves. So when we iterated and we changed variable, there was a stable Jacobian. And so when you, um, when you have one over the full Jacobian and you multiply by the stable Jacobian, you're left with one over the unstable Jacobian. And the unstable Jacobian is very big when you are close to singularity, so you can sum it over these countable, uh, these countable homogeneity layers. I mean, you get a decomposition which, which gives countably many uh, terms, but you can sum over these countable sets because you have one over the unstable Jacobian. Here you cannot afford uh, to make these countable sums because when you multiply one over the stable Jacobian by the stable Jacobian, by the change of variable, you're left with one, okay? And the number one, you cannot sum it countably many times. Maybe I said this already, but uh, I guess it doesn't hurt to repeat. So now WS uh, is going to be as yesterday. But when I take an element of WS and I iterate it uh, in the past, I will uh, not cut along homogeneity layers. I forget the homogeneity layers. The, distor the boundary distortion does play a part in some of the arguments. I mean, sometimes you have to disintegrate the SRB measure and then you have to use at the the logarithm of the, of the density has some property. But here we forget the homogeneity layers, we forget about any control of the distortion. So these are the elements 
of WS obtained by decomposing T minus NW into smooth components, so I cut whenever there's a singularity, of length at most delta zero. So we don't cut according to homogeneity layers. So the cardinality is finite. This is a set of finite cardinality. So the set has finite cardinality. It's completely, yesterday I put a hat, I think, right? So today it's a different construction. There is finite cardinality. And so the main tool is a gross lemma, which is not based on this uh, one-step expansion, but it's based directly, it's based on two things. Uh, well, let me state it first. So the first claim is that um, if delta zero is small enough, then there's a constant such that for any curves in this set, any stable manifold, the sum over this finite set is uh, actually uniformly bounded by the cardinality of Mn. Okay? So that's the first thing that we do. And that the second thing is that we have a, a, a vamped up version of this, which says that you can even sum something bigger. And this allows you to introduce some modulus of continuity, but it's going to be a logarithmic uh, modulus of uh, continuity. And this is what's going to appear in the Banach space, which now I realize I will not be able to define for you. But there are some logarithmic uh, modules of continuity in the Banach space. And that you can afford to sum, but you cannot afford to sum all the modules of continuity. And what you get here, and that's probably the last thing I can write on the board. So this is a sum j equals one to n. So that's what we can prove. Uh, and, uh, and this is also for any n, right? I forgot to put for any n. So let me just explain this, um, this formula. So S0 is a guy which appeared in the, in the assumption from assumption star. Gamma, this is uh, any gamma here. Uh, and K, I, yesterday I mentioned this uh, linear complexity. So we have linear complexity, linear bounds on complexity. So this is a classical result. I think it's a, for, in this Bunimovic, um, uh, Bunimovic Chernoff of Sinai paper, the old paper from 1990. So we use a linear bound on the complexity. And uh, so this is supposed to tell you that, um, so we lose the distortion, we can only work with, with uh, the logarithmic modulus of continuity, that's why we lose the spectral gap, although I don't have the time to give you the definition of the space. And the other thing you're supposed to understand from this formula is why there was this condition, it's probably not on the board anymore. Ah yes, it is, the condition star. So why do you have S0 log two? Where does the two come from? The two is here, and why is it two? It's two because the size, the size of um, t minus one of, um, of uh, w, it's um, in general, it's uh, big, but uh, it can be, uh, okay, how, how can you, okay, what's the bound? When you have a singularity, T minus one of W, and W is very small, T minus one of W can be uh, very big, but we have this control, the square root. 
So to prove this lemma, we use induction, we use this, we use a linear rows, and then we, we, we are able to make the sums which appear when you iterate the transfer operator, and unfortunately, I didn't have the time to, um, to give you the definition of the norm, but you're uh, uh, very welcome to ask it as a question if you want, except that I lost it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just in words, um, in this peri measure approach, what is the kind of the roughly the role of the B tilde and the B and the B weak? If yeah. you don't have a Lissot York and the eigenvalue you're finding is in right. the, B, the weak, right. what, what do you need the strong for sure. roughly? So the, the is yeah. So uh, that's because we what we're going to do. So we have a we have a weak Lissot York bound, which says that. Uh, but this is bounded by e to the n h star. Well, first we get some of these cardinalities, but then we have some exact bounds and we can reduce to that. And we have this, right. And, uh, and we also have the bound for the weak norm, but that's the main thing somehow for what I'm going to say now. And so what do we do now? We construct a sequence uh, nu j. So what is nu j? It's one over j, k equals zero j minus one. L uh, k top one, okay, and uh, and we have to multiply by e to the minus k h star, right? So this is like this is a fake. We call it the fake Lazatayo. It's not Lazatayo. There's no contraction. Right? So it's, but it's, this is uniformly bounded, right? It's super fake. I mean, you don't yeah, have yeah, contraction. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Well, actually, okay. Actually, so the, just yeah. the, the ordinary Lissot York would have exponential contraction right. in the strong Absolutely. plus and we don't have constant that. times weak. We don't but have now that. we have exponential we expansion in the strong. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. No, uh, no, 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 no. You shouldn't worry about the exponential expansion. That's not that's not a problem, right? Okay. Because I mean, the operator has spectral radius. So you shouldn't worry about this. Right? Yes. I mean, you should. Maybe I should have used a different notation. I should have said, let's call this operator. Let's say L is L top divided by e uh, h star. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. So this one is not a problem. You shouldn't worry about mm -hmm. that. The real problem is that there is no contraction, right? Yeah. Although there are some, we have stable and unstable, and there is a contraction in one of the terms. Okay, but that's what we, and this uses condition star, by the way, otherwise it's even worse. And so then what do we get from this? We get the fact that this is uh, uniformly bounded. Okay, and then I didn't say it, but just like yesterday, this inclusion is compact, right? And so I can find a subsequence uh, of the sequence which converges in the weak norm. Got it. Okay. And then you get your fixed point, or not with fixed point, maximum eigen fixed point of this guy here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well maybe we should stop now. Thank you, Vivian, again.